lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Well, I watched his response to my response to him. This man is rather silly. The way he is able to bamboozle people, um, not just with his fraudulent academic credentials, but the way he circumlocutes and speaks around issues. I answered him from the Greek text, showing what he said was nonsense. He ignores my correction of his Arabic. He ignores my mention of his bogus doctorates. He ignores all those things. And he focuses on the text of Timothy, which is fine. So he's caved in on the other issues by default. Now he's only dealing with the text, except he's not dealing with the text in context. Notice he begins by speaking about things like rules of logic. He tries to make it a philosophical debate instead of a theological debate, except that even there, he's not being honest with the text in context. He claims I have failed to deal with what he said about 1 Timothy, uh, the arguments of chapter 2, uh, about God desiring all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, all men, which he, without any basis in the text, says means all kinds of men, which he somehow relates to Revelation chapter 5. Well, he says all kinds of men. And when I point out the word genus is not there, he says, I never said the word genus is there. No, you said the word kinds was there, and that is the Greek word for kinds. Why are you playing games? Then I point out that there is no direct relationship to Revelation chapter 5 because the terms glossolalia, tongues, ethnon, racial groupings, or pule, tribes, are there, as they are in Revelation 5. He said, I didn't say they were. They're only in Revelation 5. Well, then you have no direct cognate relationship between the two texts. He uses these words when I point out that that's not what it says in the Greek. He says, I never said it did. End of argument. This man's not even rational in his argumentation. There is nothing in the text of 1 Timothy that will in any way support his contention that it's all kinds of men. But let's begin with his asegesis, his reading into the text things it doesn't say, but also the fact that he's distorting the text out of context. Remember, we have no chapter divisions in the original Greek canon on beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions, again, the word there is in tuxis, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. It's interesting the term doxa is not there. It's not praises. For kings and all who are in authority, in order that we, we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Let's look at it again. The reason we are to pray for kings and all who are in authority and all men, the reason we're to pray for them, is that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. They're living in a paganized Roman Empire where the threat of persecution is continually imminent. The reason we are to pray for the Roman government in that situation, or our government in our situation, and for all men, is that we may lead a tranquil, uh, a tranquil and quiet life in godliness with dignity in this fallen world so that we may pursue the work of the gospel in peace. That is the reason we pray for all men. It does not speak of their salvation. It is not saying we pray for them in terms of anything salvific. 
Now, that does not mean we do not pray for unsaved people and for politicians or leaders to be saved, but that's not what the text is talking about. The reason it introduces this is so that we may live a quiet and tranquil, uh, tranquil life in this fallen world to pursue the work of Jesus. That is the text in context with absolutely no basis whatsoever in the text. He changes the meaning to say it means salvation for all kinds of men when it's not even talking about salvation. It is when we get to verse 3 that the text becomes Christological and soteriological. It begins talking about the work of Christ and his nature in salvation and about salvation. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men, not all kinds of men, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Verses 1 and 2 have nothing whatsoever to do with verses 3 and 4. Nothing except in his mind. Even without reading Greek, anyone who has a fifth grade knowledge of the English language can see that verses one and two are telling us to pray for these people so they will leave us alone and that we can get on living godly lives in this fallen world and pursue the commission Jesus has given us. That's all it's saying. It's not until we get to verses three and four, it begins speaking soteriologically about salvation. Then he makes the claim that by Proceeding further in the letter, in the epistle, and going to chapter 4, I've given up on dealing with what he says about chapter 2, where what he says has nothing to do with what chapter 2 says. It's not even talking about salvation in verses 1 and 2. But to look at another passage in the same letter, speaking of the same issue, using the same language in the Greek text is not departing from context. It is he who has departed from context in making verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 say something it doesn't, neither in English or in Greek. I'll read verse 10. For it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men. Again, a Christological and a soteriological statement, especially of believers. So there it makes a distinction between all men and believers. I pointed this out from the Greek text. Even if I was to adopt his ridiculous error and say that chapter 2 means all kinds of men, which it obviously does not, but even if I was to adopt his error, he makes my case. He makes the point. Let's read it the way he would understand it, or the way he says he'd understand it. God, who is the Savior of all kinds of men, especially of believers. That would mean the same thing. He's the Savior of everybody, especially believers. He died for all but it's only efficacious for those who repent and believe. He makes no logical sense. The scripture makes a distinction between the fact that Jesus is the universal savior of everybody, but especially of believers. It doesn't work for the unregenerate. He has no license whatsoever to say that it means all kinds of men. Verses one and two of chapter two of Timothy, are not even talking about that issue. It's saying to pray for them, not so they would be saved, but so that they would leave us alone. Three and four, that begins speaking about salvation and the ministry of Christ in salvation. As does chapter four, verse 10. A text out of context in isolation from co-text is a pretext. It's not even rational, let alone exegetically plausible what he says. It cannot possibly mean what he says. It doesn't say that in English. It doesn't say it in Greek. And chapter 4, verse 10 makes it clear that he's the savior of all men, but especially of those who believe.
that's what it says. For a man to name his ministry after Radio Geneva, one would assume he would be in full agreement with what happened in Geneva. Now remember, Calvinism is not a theology. It is a philosophy primarily. It comes from 16th century humanism. John Calvin had nothing to do with the Reformation. When Erasmus translated the Textus Receptus and published his New Testament, Calvin was not yet born when Erasmus began the work, and he was a baby. He was a little boy when Luther hammered the 95 Thesis to the door in Wittenberg. And we have no record of John Calvin ever giving his testimony of having become regenerate. We cannot even be sure on the basis of anything he wrote, and he wrote quite a great deal, that he ever professed to be saved. Nonetheless, leaving that aside, let's look at Radio Geneva. Whenever you confront a Calvinist of Mr. White's persuasion with certain historical refact, facts, they always revert to some kind of a hideous revisionism. And again, I use the adjective hideous. I live in Great Britain most of the time, and when I point out that in Cromwell's England, when Calvinism was at its absolute peak, ecclesiologically, politically, and sociologically, as well as theologically, John Owen, the greatest of the Puritan writers, and I've read many of the Puritans, I've read Joseph Aileen, I've read those who are less Calvinistic among the Puritans, like Richard Baxter, but I certainly am familiar with John Owen. With John Owen as Cromwell's theological advisor and personal chaplain, the English Puritan Calvinists and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists, literally in a so-called Protestant jihad, massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ. They massacred each other to say nothing of what they did to the Irish. Can you point this out? Oh, everyone was doing that kind of thing at that time. Yeah, the Catholics did it too. Is that supposed to explain or justify it? When I pointed out what he said about the burnings and the witch burnings by the Calvinists, his argument was, well, the Catholics do it too. Wasn't the Reformation supposedly to correct what the Roman Catholic Church was doing instead of to perpetuate it? You will not find anybody more crazy than hyper-Calvinists. In England and in Salem, Massachusetts, they burned innocent people, hung innocent people, on the basis of spectral evidence. The Lord showed me Mary Jones as a witch. Oh, I had a dream and the Lord showed me she was a witch. They would tie helpless old ladies to the end of a pole, cut a hole in the ice and put her underneath it in a lake. If she didn't drown, oh, she's a witch, hang her or burn her. She has supernatural powers from darkness. If she does die, oh, we made a mistake. She's gone to heaven to be with the Lord. This is what these people literally did. Now, he names his ministry after what engendered, what spawned this kind of madness in Salem and England and elsewhere. He calls it Radio Geneva. Yet at the same time, he professes to be a Baptist. It was not only heretical Anabaptists, like Severitas, who were burned in Calvin's Geneva. To name your ministry after a regime that would have arrested and persecuted you, possibly burned you alive in the name of Jesus Christ, and you name your ministry after them, that makes about as much logical sense as a Jew naming a synagogue after the Third Reich. This man is completely, completely irrational. He's irrational in his mishandling of scripture. He's irrational in his revisionist reinterpretations of history. To name your ministry after a regime that would have persecuted you, even murdered you in the name of Christ, as they killed many others. This kind of illogicality 
cannot even be counted as the product of a rational mind. This man is blinded, spiritually and intellectually. To take 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, which only speaks of kings and of all men in terms of praying for them that they will leave us alone, and then to reinterpret the following verses, 3 and 4, saying verses 1 and 2 means Jesus is the Savior of all kinds of men, when there is nothing in the text exegetically that supports that, and nothing in the context. It's talking about two different issues entirely. This is not only asegesis, it's not only bad exegesis, it's absurdity. And to say that, looking at another verse or passage in the same epistle speaking of the same issue, that says he's the savior of all men, especially those who believed, which I read from the Greek in my first response. Well, let's put it this way. You show me somebody with a fake doctorate, and I will show you a faker. But he has not only one fake doctorate, James White has two fake doctorates. A doctorate from a non-accredited institution has as much value as an honorary degree. It has the same legal merit and the same academic credence as filling in a box top from a box of cereal and sending it away with $2.50 to get a certificate and saying you're a junior astronaut. The man is a fraud. He's not a doctor. If he came up with an exegetical argument like that at any serious academic forum or scholarly symposium, he would be laughed out of the auditorium, except that he would not be allowed to participate to begin with. He would be disqualified as a participant because he's a double barrel phony with two fake doctorates. It's easy to see why he resorted to fake doctorates. He obviously is not qualified to get a real one. He can't handle a text in context. His only response to his phony credentials is, scholarship is something you do, not something you buy. Well, if that's his position, if scholarship is something you do and not something you buy, then why did he buy it? You either are or you aren't. It is dishonest to mislead people into thinking you have accredited academic degrees that you do not possess. Again, it reflects an insecurity and a dishonesty that's unbecoming of any believer. He engages not only in asegesis, but something worse, dishonesty. Revisionist interpretations of history, naming his own ministry after people who would have killed him as a Baptist, for holding to believers' baptism. This man is not logical. He's not honest, and he is not exegetically competent. Again, show me somebody with a fake doctorate, or in his case, two fake doctorates, and I will show you a faker. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. <laughs>